Let's wait until this finishes. And then once you see Judy, you can. Yeah. Wait, not yet. Mm -hmm. okay. Just give me, a, give, give me a countdown or whatever. Welcome everyone to the uh, library of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. I'm Ivan Vevoda. I run the Europe's Futures uh, project here and uh, we have the great honor of listening today uh, to Judy Dempsey who will be speaking to us uh, from uh, Berlin. As, as you know or may not know, uh, we are in a lockdown here in Vienna and we have a curfew from 8 p.m. till 6 a.m. We had a terrorist attack uh, two days ago and I guess we've all been following the American elections and some have had more sleep than others uh, over this, this past night. Uh, things have, uh, I was going to say as usual, but it's not as usual, not gone as some uh, pollsters predicted. There wasn't a so-called blue wave and we're still waiting for results from three key states, Wisconsin, Michigan and Pennsylvania. So as, as the suspense grows, uh, I hope we'll have uh, what CNN calls a, a calm moment or a calm, not 30 seconds, but an hour and a half to discuss an extremely important topic, and that's the issue of, of the rule of law overall. But Judy will, will present uh, under the title Judges Under Pressure, uh, Europe's Unfinished Transformation. I think that's extremely appropriate. But let me just present uh, Judy briefly for those of you who don't know her. She was a longtime correspondent for the Financial Times, uh, a Jerusalem bureau chief uh, correspondent from Berlin in the 90s and, and covered from the 80s uh, Eastern Europe for the FT and the Irish Time. She subsequently moved to the International Herald Tribune, which is now the international edition of the New York Times in the 2000s as Berlin and East European correspondent and then the uh, as diplomatic correspondent. Uh, she's written a book uh, on uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel, the Merkel phenomenon and contributed to many other books and is currently, uh, as I said, in Berlin and is a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie uh, Europe, uh, which is now led by a former Europe's Futures Fellows, Rosa Balfour. And uh, Judy is also for Carnegie Europe, the editor-in-chief of Strategic Europe, which I highly re recommend to you. And last but not least, has uh, every two weeks a, a, um, a uh, series called Judy Asks. And in full disclosure, I have res been responding a few times to, to what Judy has been asking us. So, uh, Judy, really great to have you as, as a fellow uh, this year. Uh, the floor is yours. And uh, after it, of course, as usual, we will have a question and answer series. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, yeah, you can hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah. Thank you, Ivan. What a very nice welcome. And you're too modest. Um, you actually contribute an awful lot to the Judy Asks with wonderful trenchant answers. And thank you for this great scholarship. It's wonderful um, being able to think again. And to go back to my sort of my, my, my patch, which I, I was interested in from a very young age, um, I think from the age of 12, when my two brothers um, were in Prague in a little old Volkswagen in August 1968 and we had this um, fuzzy black and white television and my mother was, it was in the kitchen, my mother was saying, God, I, uh, your brothers are there in Prague, look, the Soviets are coming, we better get them out in time. And of course, there was no phones or anything. Anyway, my brothers were innocent on all of this sort of very unpolitical. And they meandered around. And in any case, they crossed the border just in time and they came home safe. And the Volkswagen survived and my brother survived. But the memory stayed with me. And, um, and the memory of, of um, Czechoslovakia stayed with me as well. And just one last thing before I get into my discussion. Um, the divided Europe always mattered to me because I never believed it would survive. 
And I always believed it was a, a, an imposed and a natural phenomenon. And I remember uh, my mother was my great inspiration. We were, it was a Sunday afternoon in Ireland and wet, we were walking down this lane. And she said, well, what are you going to do after school? Well, I said, I'll go off to university and I'll do some history or something. And then I said, I'm going off to Eastern Europe. And she said, but you'll end up in the gulag. I said, no, I won't. I won't end up in the gulag. I, I'll be all right. She, she, and then she said, you can't go. I said, I have to go. This Europe will not last as it is. It's unnatural. And in some ways, the rest is history. But the part of this discussion is about this history. So thank you, Ivan, and thank you, your great colleagues there, and thank you, viewers, for this good morning, good afternoon, and good night. Here we go. So and my talk is, um, is The Unfinished Transformation. It's, um, it's a strange title because it deals with Poland and Romania. And the Polish element should be finished. It should be finished transformation. But as I will discuss uh, today, it's becoming a, a reversed transformation. And in Romania, which is down the south, completely different political culture, completely different history, it's a transformation that has taken so long to get off the ground. And I will deal with this as well. And my point of reference is the judiciary. And the judiciary is key to the rule of law. It's key to democracy. It's key to our way of life. It's key to accountability. And it's key to trust that if you know somebody steals something from you or it does damage to you, you, can, you have redress to the courts. The courts and the judiciary are our, 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 our bread, so to speak, of, of our belief in government, our belief in the rule of law and the division of powers. So um, when I got the scholarship, it asked me, well, think, you, you have a free reign to think about this. And I said, I have to do the judges. And um, from my own experience, pre-communist and post-communist, I've had uh, quite enough um, experience in talks with the judges. So I'm going to give you two or three um, examples of Poland before I go into a slightly nitty gritty of what the what, uh, law and justice is doing to the constitutional tribunal and the judiciary. So, uh, and, then of and then I move to Romania and you can quiz me with, with any questions or whatever. I want to give you um, quite a disturbing example of the pressure of judges. Um, this judge is called Judge Beate Morowicz. And she's the president of the main board of the Themis Association of Judges. And she was president of the regional court in Krakow until 2017. This lady is very very feisty, very committed to values, very committed to the rule of law, very committed to defending individuals and above all, the independence of the judiciary and the impartiality of judges. And she was always bravely and, and, and publicly criticizing um, the, the role of the judges and when law and justice finally could consolidate their power in 2015, she became much more assertive in defending the, the, the judiciary. 2015 is very important because uh, law and justice was re-elected, uh, no, it was elected after uh, a stint in power in 2005-2007. That was when it tried to tinker with the judiciary. It had lots of conspiratorial theories. It was, it's a, it's a story we'll go back to in this text, but law and justice was about having revenge on the liberal elites and was about um, attaining an extraordinary amount of control, which, I mean, they, they, they could only, um, the, the communists could only praise them, frankly, but that's another story. So, um, more of it, she was uh, campaigning against the kind of uh, pressure on the judiciary in, 20, in, in 2015, and she was dismissed from her office. And uh, why? Because, um, she was allegedly accused of having organized activities with a, with a criminal group. And um, she just couldn't um, understand what was going on. And she tried to um, sue the person 
and, the, and those people making these false accusations against her. Interestingly, uh, other judges in the region and in Warsaw and other cities turned out to support her. But uh, over little effect, uh, she was under huge pressure and she was forced to resign. This is just one, one pressure we know. And then uh, there's a, an, another pressure. This is, this is another one, a very interesting one. Um, the case, uh, maybe some of you know her, uh, the case of um, uh, Susanna rudinska Blut. She wants to be the ombudsman. It's a very important role, the ombudsman uh, in Poland. And uh, this was uh, quite recently, 2020. This woman is, it's interesting, two women. This woman is very interesting. Um, Poland is so polarized at the moment, but she reached out to law and justice, the governing law and justice. She reached out to the opposition groups, uh, NGOs, activists, Democrats, held town, town hall meetings, said, you know, this is why I want to be ombudsman. I want to support civil rights. I want to support uh, equality before the law, gender rights and so on. And uh, the law and justice started a shocking campaign against her. And uh, they didn't, they, when, when she tried to defend herself, they didn't want to listen. And essentially she lost the battle. So this is the kind of, um, just two examples of the pressure that, um, that judges are under at the moment in Poland. And they're under it because since 2015, um, law and justice has implemented a, 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 a package of legislation that essentially the judiciary has been um, hijacked, I suppose, or captured by the executive branch represented by the Minister of Justice. And the Minister of Justice had extraordinary powers and some, some legal experts in Poland call it far reaching and often completely discretionary power to interfere with the staffing of common courts even, and to indirectly influence uh, judges and control their careers. We've seen this with the Constitutional Court, trying to tinker with the Constitution. Uh, we've seen it on all sorts of levels, even on education. And uh, when I'm speaking to some uh, judges over the past couple of weeks, uh, the, the new measures interfere with the appointment of judges on the local level, on the town level, on the voivod, on the district level, on every single level. And essentially, it's all discretionary. And the recourse to justice, the recourse to address these, uh, these interferences uh, seem impossible because law and justice is actually getting its hands completely on the judiciary. They make the appointments. They can push older judges into retirement. They can appoint their own. The system of accountability is actually decreasing at a rapid rate. Now, um, the, the good thing, I suppose, is that uh, Poland, the Polish judiciary, is getting a huge amount of support from other uh, judicial authorities across the EU. And I'm not talking about the EU at the moment, but the, the Bar Association in, in Great Britain, uh, Germany, in France, uh, petitions from legal experts from across the United States and so on. Yet, they seem, uh, law and justice seems undeterred and they continue to actually uh, put extraordinary pressure on the judiciary. And the more the judiciary faces this pressure, the more the rule of law is degraded. And the more the rule of law is degraded, wait for the day when the whole democratic, uh, de democratic infrastructure will be degraded. Democracy and the rule of law and judiciary go hand in hand. And if you cut off the fingers of, of a few of them, you weaken the other, but there's only, there's only so far you can actually proceed and protect democracy and the rule of law um, without a judiciary. The judiciary is crucial for our values, for European values. And it is a crucial element because look what Poland came from. I mean, before 1989, um, I mean, we, we saw how the judiciary was, was communist led, communist influenced, that the education was communist, that the ideology and so on. There's bits of free leeway here and there, but it was a communist legal system. And it was imposed on the judges. And now we have an extraordinary system where law and justice is imposing actually its authority on the judiciary. And these decisions, by the way, 
are made partly because, uh, mostly because law and justice has a majority in the Polish same or parliament. But the way these decisions are made, midnight, midnight sessions over Christmas two or three years ago, intimidating uh, judges, um, and of course, use of the media. We must never underestimate that the attack on the judiciary has been coupled with growing control of the media. And this is the Poland that wanted to join the European Union. This is the Poland that wanted to do away with the communist control over social life, over the media, over the judiciary, over politics. And yet we have a system now that is, is a creeping um, de-democratization. And it is extremely disturbing what is happening to this big, important country in the middle of Europe. This was a country that wanted to be European, that wanted to shake off the vestiges of the communist past. Somehow law and justice is reversing the transformation and doing extraordinary danger to a country that had enormous potential to be a major, major player inside the European Union. Um, I'm, I can leave this for the questions session. I'm ambiguous about how this will all turn out. The, 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 um, the plus side of Poland is an extraordinarily vibrant civil society um, across all ages, from very old judges to very young people, from men and women and young students across the board. And um, we have seen this particularly over the demonstrations that women mobilized um, against these very, very strict um, uh, abortion legislation that law and justice and the church wanted to bring in. And so this is sort of backfired with the, the legislation has been put off at the moment. But um, the church is doing itself no favors and it's going to be damaged permanently by this. And law and justice, I saw in the opinion polls recently, has lost 10%. Opinion polls matter for this government because if they lose, they will have to actually be accountable. But the accountability will only be there if the civil society and the activists ensure that the whole judicial system is not entirely destroyed. I think the civil society is strong enough, but law and justice and its supporters are stubborn enough to, to undermine and to undo something so immensely important to the integrity of a Polish country. This is not about a Polish nation. This is about the Polish values. And if Kaczynski, that's leader of the law and justice, wants to argue that this is about the Polish nation, well, the Polish nation actually will do itself a huge amount of damage if it actually undoes the democracy, which Poland has been fighting for, for centuries, not, since, not just since um, the Second World War. So that's one element of Poland. Um, now, if you, if you go down to Romania, it's, it's a rather interesting comparison. Um, when I first went to Romania, I was... Um, I was surprised by the, this was just when Ceausescu, before Ceausescu went on his huge austerity, anti-IMF, anti-everything plan um, in 1980, 1981. And I was struck by the, uh, the it, was, it was ambiguous. It's a, it was a beautiful city, Bucharest at the time, but it was also verging on a grayness and the propaganda was extraordinary. And the more I went down to Romania, um, it, the more it deteriorated and above all the, the security was literally ubiquitous. Uh, in the end, my very old connections and distant friends, and there were a few far between um, when I used to knock at the door after shaking off the security, one old lady who had suffered during the Stalinist time says, Judy, go away, they're going to get me. I had my passport, I could always leave. Those people couldn't. They didn't have lighting, they didn't have heat, they didn't have access to proper food, they didn't have access to health, and above all, they didn't have access to safety. And um, it was these people that taught me a lot about what freedom is and what the idea of values is and democracy and the rule of law. And um, I paid tribute to these, these people who suffered a huge amount under the Ceausescu regime. So when 1989 came, and um, there I was um, driving up from 
um, from Vienna via Belgrade over the border to, um, to Sofia and up to Rusa, um, where some of you know Elias Canetti was born. And uh, Bucharest was in turmoil. This was around Christmas in 1989. And um, I got into a, one of these vans, uh, one of these um, shuttle vans. And, um, and the driver said, oh, you sit in the front. And I said, I really don't want to sit in the front. Well, nobody else wants to sit in the front. There's a spare seat here. And if you don't want to take it, then we can't take you. So I sat in the front of this minivan and we sped along to Bucharest. And now I know why you put me in. There were snipers all over the place in Bucharest. And I was really very frightened. In any case, I jumped out and I paid them and I eventually found a hotel to stay in. And it was really terrifying. Um, the, the pent up huge anger of, of the Romanians um, combined with the extraordinary... Um, willpower of the security and the old elite to stay in power and it was dangerous and was frightening and when the sort of dust did settle and the execution of, of um, Elena and Nikolai Ceausescu certainly didn't help matters um, I went back several times in 1990-91 and the old guard was still there I mean, in different, different kind of parties but they were still there and uh, I said to myself, I mean, there's no transformation here. There's no round table. It was pretty frightening. Uh, and um, there was, it was an insidious atmosphere. And I'm not saying this with, the, with a distorted memory. I reread some of my, my, my cuttings recently and um, there was no movement. And the, the, the big push for, for change didn't really come. Anyway, I kept going back for as long as I could. And, um, and then very briefly to speed forward, it was a, a very dark night, one Friday evening in Bucharest in 2007, I think. And uh, Monica McAvoy was the justice minister at the time. And um, she was in her office, dark office, in that huge uh, Ceausescu building, dark, mammoth gargantuan and I was brought in, into this this ridiculously um, um, chamber and the thing she told me was quite horrific the pressure she was this is the justice minister and her portfolio was uh, anti-corruption combating corruption and I said well how difficult is she I'm intimidated I can't uh, I can't bring anybody into the courts and if I do the judges are intimidated as well and are paid off and I said well what about the political class she said what political class I mean the elites are all you know if they're not the same old um, colors of the security or or whatever or the are the or there's the relation in some way it's about the status quo not wanting change because change will actually mean they would lose a certain status. But I said, you want to join the EU? And she said, well, we're meant to be joining very soon. In any case, to cut a long story short, the European Union knew exactly what was going on in Romania or what wasn't in terms of the independence of the courts. In any case, Romania did join the EU. And um, even then the corruption, extraordinary corruption continue to this day. This corruption is not about backhands, no, not only about backhands, it's not only about the old elites of the status quo capturing the media. This is not just about um, bribes for investment contracts or whatever. This is about muzzling the judiciary. This is about actually stopping the creation of an independent judiciary that is separate from the executive. This is about allowing judges to do their work on the, on the prosecutor general level, on the city level, on the town level, in the cities, everywhere. You talk to judges in Romania and the, they're not as open as the judges in, in, in Poland, but they're becoming much more open now, especially the younger generation. And they, they complain of the, the intimidation, but above all, no political will or the huge weak political will by the elites. And I'm talking about the Liberal Party and I'm talking about the, 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 social, the social Democrats as well to actually push through the necessary change. Why is this? 
well, uh, we're not just talking about um, trials or bringing um, individuals to justice or putting them behind bars. That's, that's a superficial answer. It's about creating strong democratic institutions. And if you create strong democratic institutions, you actually create accountability. You actually create a system of absolute checks and balances. And if you have checks and balances, you can actually say, this is wrong and this is right. This is what it says in, uh, legally. This is what it says for our political integrity. And um, one lawyer I spoke to two weeks ago, she said to me, I said, well, why, why is it that this, this corruption continues despite being in the EU and despite all the so-called pressure from the EU? She said, because if they had democracy, they wouldn't know what to do with it and they would lose out. Well, you know, there are winners and losers with democracy, but democracy tries to spread its, its branches to be as inclusive as possible. This is a few remarks about Romania. The other remark I want to say about Romania is that we have to, I think we have to take in the political culture. Um, and it's not just because of what the Securitate, how the Securitate acted under Ceausescu or before that uh, under the Stalinist regime of uh, Constantinescu. It was very, very cruel. It, it, it was cruel. And Cruelty leaves a, a terrible mark on people's lives. And it's not that individuals are wanting revenge, but it leaves a scar and it makes transitions very, very complicated and demands time and it demands dialogue. And because this dialogue generally has been absent since 1990, the scars, if they have diminished, they've been replaced now by a status quo that really questions the value of democracy. This is the first thing. Secondly, the Romanians have had a very uh, um, tough historical past. Uh, the Turks at the Fenariads, they all chucked their dues when it came to tax collection. And this leaves another element of, of corruption of, well, we did in the past, a bribe here, a bribe there. And uh, it's, it's, it's in the political culture to this day. And I remember a few years ago uh, talking to some young Romanian students um, up, in, up, uh, up in Brasov and uh, they were studying medicine. And I said, well, how's the system now? Oh, we give a bribe here to get better marks or we do this. And I said, you don't do this, do you? Well, we have to, you know, I, yeah, I want to get good grades and then I get a job outside. Huh. So if I get good grades, I can, I can leave the country. Which brings me to the third point. And I try to be optimistic about, about these countries, the diaspora. Um, the diaspora in, in both Poland and Romania are just hugely important. There are hundreds of thousands of young Romanians working in EU countries as there are Poles working in EU countries. These are highly motivated, highly energetic, um, and highly smart people, and uh, frankly, it's it's great to, it's great that they are in the old EU and that the new EU and the old EU have this wonderful sense of culture. There's a plus and a minus. The brains leave these countries, and when you get uh, pretty. Uh, mean governments, whether it's in Warsaw or in Bucharest, they must be delighted to get rid of, to keep the diaspora out because the uh, diaspora have a political consciousness and they see how democracy works. It's with all its flaws and with all its pluses in other EU countries. So keep them away because if they come back, they're going to really upset the status quo. Well, the Romanian diaspora did come back to elect President Johannes uh, several years ago and came back again. Um, and he has his own problems um, trying to fight corruption, but they came back and there are trends now um, with, with the, the corona that more and more young Romanians are going back, firstly. And secondly, the young Romanians who do stay there, um, it's very important, they are becoming the new middle class who aren't dependent on the state. And they're setting up their own businesses, which makes them independent. And if you are part of this new middle class, you want the rule of law. You want clear property rights. You want accountability. So it's a kind of hope I have 
as I say, transformations take time, but perhaps this new middle class, which is creating, by the way, new political parties, especially on the local level, maybe they're only getting nine or 10% now, but it doesn't matter. They're, breaking, they're trying to break this lock that the old political parties had. So, so this is the plus side. Um, given all the political cultural elements of Romania and all its problems with corruption, we have to find some kind of silver lining that a younger generation will come through. And the third thing, and I will leave this up to um, the, the audience or whoever who's ever out there in the stratosphere, is the role of the EU. Every poll I've spoken to, they're so pro-EU, but they are so disappointed that the EU doesn't speak out and defend the values that the architecture of the European Union is based on. This is another issue, and this is another talk, but I think I'll end it there, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Uh, thank you also for your personal... I forgot to take the microphone. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the presentation of your project and also for your personal recollections, which always add so much color and depth. Uh, to the subjects that, that we're talking about. The, the, lots of food for thought, lots of questions. Um, before I uh, open it up to, to the others, um, let me ask you a, a broader point, which we briefly discussed before we went online. And that is um, the influence of, of the challenges that American democracy has and uh, the questions that arise not only from the election that that yeah. we're living literally as, as we speak here, um, because it seems that, are, that there are a lot of people who feel, or leaders, as in Poland or in Romania, who feel quote unquote empowered and saying, look, if, if this is possible in America, yeah. you know, why shouldn't we behave the way that egotistically we want to remain within a captured state, all things being equal, uh, of course. Yes, I knew you would answer, uh, ask me a tough question, Ivan. Thank you. But it's a very topical one and it's a really important one. Um, whoever enters the White House, this has been an extremely dangerous contested election. And if uh, Trump stays in the White House, this will be a solace for uh, populist parties in Europe and it would be a plus for authoritarian leaders, whether it's in Turkey, China, Russia. Um, this is the first thing. Secondly, the shine of America, the attraction of America as the, as the bedrock of democracy, of, of the visibility of powers, of, 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 of the rule of law, of everything, it's, it has been diminished under Trump. And if he gets another four years, um, there will be leaders in Europe, in the EU and outside the EU will say, well, you know, America, this used to be the great beacon. If, 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 if America does it, we'll beacon too. So it's, um, it's bad news if this happens. And it's very disturbing because it leaves Europe and some other countries um, not isolated, but they have to take uh, they'd have to really ask themselves, how are we going to actually protect and nourish our democracies? Because there will be an awful lot of other leaders that will take advantage of what's happening in the United States. This is, this is the pessimistic side to all of this. Uh, let me uh, take you back to, to your conclusion and addressing the question of, of the European Union. Uh, you recently wrote a, a very good piece uh, whose title was Europe should stop moaning, whining and, and crying. Um, the, the fact that you um, quoted your interlocutors, and, and we know from public opinion polls since Brexit and since the Trump victory in 2016 that the European Union support uh, to the general question, you know, are you happy that you are in the European Union, massive majorities in all these countries, including Poland, including Romania and Hungary. And yet, as you rightly said, the, the disappointment. 
we, we cannot avoid the question. We know that there are tools uh, in, in the European treaties. There's Article 7. Well, two, two parts to that question. One, how, how much has that helped so far? And where do you see it going? Hmm. How much has it helped so far? On, on these issues of that, that you are tackling, the, yeah. the rule of law yeah. and judiciary. And the more I think about it, Ivan, the more um, the more I'm the more I think the, the EU doesn't live up to its rhetoric. There's an awful lot of rhetoric and nice stuff written. I have 27 reports um, that that the EU uh, the EU's first report on values, which they released in September. I read them all. And it's good stuff. You know, it's, there's lots of detail in them, but you have to act on it. They won't act on Bulgaria. They won't act on Bul uh, Romania. And I and have asked um, Romanians and Bulgarian, uh, Rom Polish lawyers and Bulgarian, by the way, why, why doesn't the EU act? And they say, first of all, we're so disappointed. But when you ask the EU and it, who is the EU, whether it's uh, members of the European Parliament or in the Commission of the Council, well, they have this extraordinary one is, well, uh, we don't want a backlash. We don't want to create an anti-EU sentiment. That's not going to happen. I mean, I, I, there's so many um, Poles and Bulgarians and Romanians that want the EU to take a stand. So stop second guessing what the citizens want. The citizens want a strong EU that defends their rule of value. And this is a typical EU response. Oh, well, we can't take action on Belarus because we don't want to offend Mr. Putin or blah, blah, blah. I, I, we, have this, we have this treaty or we don't. And um, the, the citizens of Poland and Romania want the EU treaty to be implemented. Um, this, is, this is the first thing. Secondly, we have a serious problem with the composition of the European Parliament because of these political caucuses. And some of these parties um, belong to the European People's Party uh, in Eastern Europe. And the European People's Party has been extremely weak and cowardly in addressing the issues of rule of law and taking the task. So they defend the rule of law rhetorically, but they actually won't implement it because a bit like the status quo and the elites in these countries, they want the votes to stay in power. And so I think... Um, we need uh, one or two things. We need qualified majority voting. And if uh, Viktor Orban or Kaczynski says, we're going to veto this, let's see what happens. And if, if, um, if Hungary or Romania or Bulgaria or Poland uh, stops the, the, the EU huge 700 billion recovery plan, let's see if they're going to really stop it. Call their bluff. This is petty intimidation either we're strong enough and intellectually and morally strong enough to defend our values or we give into this three percent three to four percent of poland's gdp as hungary's is made up of the structural funds it's taxpayers money and now under law and justice and the abuse of the courts we don't even see the transparency of some of this money no, sorry please. for such a long answer no no, no absolutely this is, this is so frustrating there's uh, there's a question uh, up in, in the chat room, which I will read, which is uh, general and along the lines of, of uh, your previous responses just now. Uh, hi, Judy. Uh, how to have a really united European Union when uh, Janusz Janša, the Slovenian prime minister, congratulated this morning Donald Trump to his success in the election? Uh, of course, the votes are not counted yet when the U.S. ambassador in Hungary praised Viktor Orban as a Trump before Trump, when rising right-wing populists in Italy, France, Hungary only stick to EU because of money from cohesion funds and structural funds. So how, how can we have a, a united European Union? It's uh, obviously it's beyond the remit of, of your project, but obviously no, you're, no. you're in a core place, uh, not only Berlin and... Well. How do we keep the European united on, on this? Well, it's a great question, and thank you for it. Um, it's united on a, on it's united on a, a, a lowest common denominator in some ways. Um, it's united because of the uh, things that actually are important to all the member states: uh, free movement of capital, labour, the Schengen system. I mean, these are fundamental to the European Union, but. Uh, these are not communicated. 
so on one level, we have this united area for economy and trade, but politically, we're absolutely not united. And this is the disparity uh, between, but inside the EU, the economic and trade, which functions quite well, and the free movement of capital, and the other side, the political. And I don't know what the audience thinks of this, but I think we actually need a much more robust political integration. Because the longer we don't have political integration, the more we'll have these disparate elements and um, different um, groups of countries ganging up on each other or playing off one against the other. Um, it's, it's really not sustainable. I think we have to push the envelope much further and have a political integration. We have the, if we don't, we will just become an economic block that can be exploited and we won't have the political tools to support it. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I'll continue uh, <laughs> uh, talking with you and, and posing uh, questions. Um, clearly, the European Union enlargement process is mm -hmm. one where these countries and the two that you're working on, Poland and, and Romania, uh, among all the others, were uh, in what I like to call a, a pressure cooker situation. They had to fulfill uh, all the uh, acquis communautaire, uh, to meet the Copenhagen criteria. And there was a real sort of, uh, you know, atmosphere of the year before graduation. You have to cram for the exams, pass them, et cetera. And, and they earnestly made efforts. Romania and Bulgaria that were taken in in 2007, as you mentioned, then remained under special kind of control and oversight. Uh, Again, uh, you follow this very closely, and in particular, and that's why I'm, uh, I find it so important that you are working on the rule of law, and as you so justly said, that is the backbone of any democratic, situa uh, any democratic system. It is the backbone of a system in which an open society is possible and in which checks and balances work. Have uh, have Romania uh, has Romania because it's your theme uh, really done so? Is the fact that Laura Coveshi, one of the yeah, uh, judges and anti-corruption uh, judicial officials, has been promoted to the head EU anti-corruption person? Is that uh, kind of a, a positive? because we are looking for some positive yeah. uh, elements yeah. in all this. And I'm glad you mentioned, of course, Monica Macovey, who was the justice minister who helped, if I can put it, dr drive Romania over the cross line, over the finish line for the membership, a very courageous uh, person. Uh, I think she's, she's an MEP, if I'm not mistaken or, or not. I can't remember where she is right now. But anyway, uh, the, 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 the question is the role of individuals and yeah. how they make a difference. I mean, a courageous leader yeah. in whatever segment, in this case, in oh. the segment of the judiciary, yeah. has made a huge difference. Yeah. Um, this is a double-edged sword, Ivan, because, I mean, the, 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 the Social Democrats did everything in their power to stop K K Laura Kovici getting this job. And it's the first ever time that the Europeans will have this prosecutor general. Um, but she got it. And, my, and the EU did defend her. Which is in, in spite good. of Romanian opposition. To exactly. It. I mean, it was extraordinary. The, the op it was, they were so afraid of her. Now, um, there's two elements to this. Uh, answer. One is she's out of the way because she was a thorn in the side of them. Oh, great, another one gone out of the way. Okay, she's in Luxembourg. And um, um, first of all, this new office is understaffed. Um, they haven't got the resources. They've got too many cases to deal with. And so she's in the front line of delivering, which is going to be very, very difficult for her. But the fact that she's there with this enormous uh, mindset and experience is good news. In that sense, individuals make a difference. But individuals cannot act alone. They need the civil society. They need activists. They need help. We've seen this in the cases of these, of these Polish judges and, the, and the, the, the lady who wants to be the ombuds uh, person. They need... They need the, the element of the society to support them. 
And this is why the Belarusian example is so interesting because it's not individuals, it's, it's a, a huge outpouring of this is our country and we've got to defend our values. So on the one hand, individuals do matter hugely, but on the other hand, it must be complemented by leaving a legacy of younger people coming through. Extremely important. And the, the, the Belarusian example is, I think, very telling in so many ways. It, it replicates a bit 1989 in, in different ways. It's an eruption from, it's a really a bottom up movement. It, it, unless I'm interrupting here. I've lost you, Ivan. I, I've lost Ivan. Uh, I can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yeah, super, super. Yeah, sorry, the, the, um, I guess the um, battery in the mic went wrong. It's, it's the, the Belarusian element is just leaving aside the EU helplessness. The fact that they can continue and they're not totally reliant on a coordinating council. And they have these self-help organizations throughout the country. And it's exactly what Navalny is doing in Russia, that um, one, uh, the, the, org the movement is not dependent on one individual. And that really scares the ruling elites. Right. And, but this is so astonishing in, in Belarus. And I think the, the Polish, uh, the Polish um, pride in their neighbor, at least on the, on the societal level, is so, so huge and so supportive. We, we have a next question from Mirjana Tomic, um, who thanks you for your brilliant presentation. Uh, her question is, will you see, will we see the rule of law implemented in Central Europe and Southeast Europe during your lifetime, our lifetimes? Yes. Okay. We have well, to. That, we well, have to. Yeah, well, that, that's why we're here. We're hoping to have it happen as, as quickly <clears throat> as 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 possible, absolutely. Um, the next question is from Klaus Proempers, who ah. said, "Will in the end of Europe of two velocities, two speeds of Volkan Schäuble and Karl Lammers mm -hmm. from the mid '90s, uh, a possibility to form a more coherent Europe? So, is a two-speed Europe a more coherent Europe?" Yeah. Hi, Klaus. It's uh... It's good to hear from you uh, virtually. Um, hmm. In some ways, we have different speeds. We've got the speed of the Eurozone. We've got the Schengen. We've got the different defense opt-outs. But I know, I know what you're getting at. Um, if we don't, if, if we keep waiting, we will never have a speedy Europe. And maybe we do need um, the two-speed Europe to propel Europe into a much more integrated um, fashion, firstly. Secondly, it so much depends on communication. Two-speed Europe must not be exclusive. And those who are ready to be part of this speed can join it. We're not talking about a first, a, a first class or a second class or a third class in, in, a, in, a, in a train. But something has to give, something has to move to actually to actually stop the political element of the EU from uh, stultifying. And this is the danger I see. We're quite happy discussing artificial intelligence, data exchange, uh, economy, trade, uh, trade relations with Canada or Singapore, whatever. But um, if we don't go for the political integration on, on, on at least pushing it on one speed, um, I, I think the EU is in, is in serious danger of, of a kind of atrophy. If I can just add a quick note on this, Ivan. Um, the danger of the two-speed Europe is the perception of it. That, is, that uh, for some of the, the Eastern countries or the Central European countries, that will be led as ever by France and Germany, and even more importantly, by a Gaullist France that will set its own um, diktats or vision for Europe. Well, if that is the case, join the debate and decide what, what you want from Europe instead of criticizing and moaning it. What sort of Europe do we want? We messed around with the convention for such a long time when Joschka Fischer, the former Greens German foreign minister, really wanted a dynamic integrated Europe. But just stop, if you want, if you have ideas about Europe, come with them, 
put them on the table and you don't need a two year convention to do this. This can be done rather succinctly and the speeds can be, can be modulated. Uh, indeed, that uh, has been the, the complaint, if, if one can put it that way, that uh, exactly as you said, you know, come with proposals, uh, speaking to the so-called smaller countries in the European Union, you are equal partners at the table, come, come with things forward. Um, before we go to the next question, um, let me, I think you rightly said we're working, uh, Europe, the European Union is working on the basis of the lowest common denominator. You add to that the kind of real politic and real economic of the fact that there are so many intertwined economic and trade interests. Uh, you know, there's been a, a very good uh, article on the way that the German car industry uh, present in Hungary with numerous big factories uh, is a weight on the issue of how does Germany uh, request a more transparent policy on, on the use of European funds. So to be cynical, obviously there are, there are so many intervening factors that then lead the European Union to go to this lowest common denominator. And basically, you know, if we stick together on the basic strategic interest and don't look too much into your shopping bag or, or to the way that you spend the money, everything's okay. Again, in a cynical world, and if the European Union were alone in the world, that would be fine. But we know that the European Union is, uh, you know, to put it a bit brutally, a diminishing force in terms of population, in terms of, you know, economic weight down the future, if we see a China continuing the way it is, uh, if we see a world of G2 between the US and China, so it is definitely not enough. And I think that's what we're talking about here. And that's among all the other things that you're saying. Last but not least, of course, it's about, you know, who will be preserving the values that we cherish of democracy, rule of law and, and rights. Okay. So that, that was sort of may, maybe, maybe a comment of, of your, you know, we're here to fight to, to push forward, but we're being pulled down by the kind of real economic in and political interest. Okay. Okay. You, you raised three great points, Ivan. Um, we have a, 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 EU has a serious problem that it doesn't have strategic interests. It has national interests. And it doesn't act strategically. And this is a, a real uh, break on, on trying to promote and the EU's views, even, even as close as the Western Balkans. We do not think strategically what we have to do with our neighbor. This is, it's, it's down the road from Vienna. And we, have, we, have, we, we saw the case in Northern Macedonia, how we sat on this for such a long time. And we, we allowed all sorts of different influences to come to play here. We've left power vacuums in our neighborhoods. Power vacuums, which are exploited by Turkey, which are exploited by China, by Russia, and Hello, America is absent generally, except when they men want to mess around with Serbia and Kosovo without consulting us. This is the first thing. Um, linked to this is, um, I mentioned political integration because national interests are stopping political integration. Politi it, political integration is actually about pooling elements of sovereignty. And we have pooled quite a lot of sovereignty when it comes to economic and trade issues. But we have to decide what kind of strategic outlook we really want. And um, I do have to mention the terrorist acts in Vienna because they, um, they are about um, the threats and the big security challenges that all the EU countries face. And for the moment, because we haven't defined our strategic interests, it's because we don't have a common threat perception. Well, if Vienna doesn't uh, confirm why we need one and, uh, and the attacks in Paris and Nizza and what has happened in London in the past, then we're going to go nowhere with our security and strategic interests. So strategic interests must, will have to collide with national interests. And okay. this is what Daimler and others are doing in Hungary. Um, and just one other point, uh, who's going to defend um, uh, our, our values? You know, go, go and ask von der Leyen. Um, it, it, 
there are some great people in the European Parliament, but it's not enough. Okay, there, there's the next question, and I don't see who's asking it. Um, uh, we, uh, it says, Mark Leonard recently said, many nationalists have come to realize that a nation state cannot rescue itself by standing alone, while globalists increasingly recognize that there will never be a perfect international order while Trump, Putin, Xi Jinping are in power. Do you agree with this? And if yes, is a EU-wide compromise and rule of law based conditionality at all realistic? Okay, great question. Um, let me be provocative here and uh, let's, let's stop the blame game. So if Trump enters the White House for the next four years, yeah, there's going to be even more mourning from the EU. Um, I think we have to take a step back and look at what has happened uh, to the post-1945 um, architect. The post-1945 architecture was based on multilateral institutions for economic reasons, for peaceful reasons, for political reasons, and it worked. It certainly worked during the Cold War. But after the Cold War, we became intellectually lazy about defending them or moving them forward. And by the way, Trump is not new to this element of being anti-multilateralism. It's, it's been a seesaw in, in, in American politics for quite a long time. You know, Anti-UN anti or pro-UN, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an American reflex, but it became incredibly sharpened and, and accentuated under Trump. So, um, the, the, you, the Blaming China and Russia and America isn't going to get us anywhere. Um, what, the, what the Europeans have to do is recognize that they cannot go it alone and they're not strong enough politically to do so. So, um, and since the Europeans say they're multilater multilateral in instinct and they really need it, well then let's reach out to like-minded allies like Canada, like South Korea, like Japan, like several African countries, several Latin American countries, Singapore, reach out and have a, a, a wider a community of multilateralism. If we're going to just wait for the next four years, whoever gets into the White House, and by the way, if Biden does win, it's going to be a very difficult time for him. We cannot wait. We've got to change the structures of, uh, since the post 1945 structures are fading and weakening, we've got to replace them and modernize them and reach out to India as well. And um, there's talent there and we've got to harness it. And I, it shouldn't be so difficult to do this. There are great leaders in these countries and, and great minds that we could bring together and, and reinforce democracy so that reformers who don't live in democratic countries can still see the attractiveness of Europe and the attractiveness of these universal values which they struggle for. Okay, we have a next question from uh, your colleague, Europe's Futures Fellow, Sirjan Svich. You talk about different speeds of Europe, but do you see an answer in reinforcing the rule of law through reforming the decision-making procedure under Article 7 of uh, and adopting qualified majority voting and coupling this with faster membership for Western Balkan mm. countries accompanied with conditional suspension of voting rights in the council until the new member states fully meet the criteria under article two of the treaties. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there are, these are very tough questions. Okay, yeah. let me do, deal with article seven. Um, I and mean, if you're going to threaten article seven, see it through. Um, and um, I think we should put literally in this case our money where our mouth is and deal with the whole voting system of, of the EU and the council. Um, I think we, I, I don't think we can flag this anymore. It needs implementation. And by the way, it's just not Central European countries, it's old EU member states as well. They've gotten away with so much and they can hide behind Hungary or Poland or other countries. This is the first thing. Faster membership, I, there isn't an appetite for it at the moment. Um, so what are we going to do about this? And these countries are far from ready, but they need, they need a huge amount of different help 
in terms of the media, in terms of investment, in terms of the rule of law and building up the judiciary and the infrastructure. Um, and the EU, uh, bits and pieces are only doing this. Um, the perspective is very, very important. We have to give a perspective to the Western Balkans to join the EU. But on the other hand, the EU has to reform itself. We, uh, to take in more members with this discombobulated structure would be actually, um, I think, um, uh, not negative. It wouldn't do the European Union any good, frankly. I think we should reform the House as quickly as possible and, and prepare the Western Balkans in uh, parallel. That's how, that's how I see it. Now, uh, the third point is, oh, if you join, can you be suspended? Um, I won't mention who, but um, um, a, a former um, very, very close advisor to Javier Solana said to me, listen, th th these NATO countries, they don't give a toss about democracy. Kick them out and let them reapply. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very interesting comment, but reapplying, re they're not going to go to China, they're not going to go to Russia, they know where their bread is buttered on. But make sure then that we tell them, you know, how much this butter costs. Absolutely. Uh, next question is from Ioanni, uh, Ioannis Almakolas. Uh, Judy, thank you very much for this thought-provoking talk. One question. An obvious deficiency in the vision of domestic transformation that is supposed to be accomplished through the EU accession process is the easiness that reforms can be rolled back after accession and the difficulty to prevent these on the part of the EU. Should we maybe rethink the strategy of front-loading massive but reversible reforms before accession? Maybe consider more flexible schemes that will move chunks of the reforms after accession, but with some sort of safeguards against what we see in Hungary, Poland, and elsewhere? You've just answered the question. It's, it's, a, it's a great one. Um, it's a very important one, and it goes back to my original element. I mean, we're sitting very comfortably in, in societies that didn't, uh, that we were already living in democracies. And um, transformation is unbelie uh, it's unbelievably complex. These Germans were very lucky because they had a very rich uh, West Germany to support them. But they're psychologically and politically unbelievably complicated. And curiously, um, under the communist era, the transformation was more complicated, I think, and forgive me if there are any Spaniards listening, I think it was much more complicated than, uh, than when, when the Spaniards uh, got rid of uh, Franco and the Portuguese and the Greeks got rid of the Junta. It was a different kind of authoritarianism. And the scars that, that uh, the communist system did, uh, they take a long time to heal. So I, I of, when I was covering the enlargement, I often wondered, was the a key a community too much for them to, to internalize? Yes, the, uh, I remember the Hungarians telling me, oh, Judy, we've done this, we've done that, we've implemented this. No, no, we've passed this. We've passed all this legislation. But legislation is one thing, implementation is another. And maybe, maybe this is an interesting question. Maybe, maybe because the complexities of the absorption of the legislation and the implementation, it um, it didn't create the necessary strong civil service or the necessary strong political structures um, to couple this transformation. Maybe that's one of the weaknesses now. I, I'm I, I'm not sure, but but maybe it's one element of it. But but look how the rule of law is even being questioned in Great Britain, the bastion of 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 of, uh, of the mother of laws. It's very, it goes back to this deep need of, of strong legislative executive uh, balances and checks and balances, but the transformation, it was very quick and it maybe didn't consolidate the division of powers. No, I, I fully agree with your argument. And uh, I think we could have a long discussion on that. The, 
the um, the sequels, the the consequences of of long communist mm. rule, and of course all of these societies, or many of them, were rural societies before yeah. the Second World War, exactly. and so that there's a compounding mm. uh, of of the ills and the atomization that came under under communism, and the fact that people simply did not have any. Uh, possibility to feel what uh, you know action was or be, being actors uh, in on the political scene so there's a whole learning process that goes on and then you rightly say you know when you have the the mother of all democracies and parliaments the UK or England you know when Boris Johnson the prime minister wants to prorogue parliament and basically you know sideline it um, you, you wonder, you know, what, what's left for the others to do. But of course, then there's the high court, which is able to stop him uh, doing that. So again, the importance of the judiciary in that case, again, uh, was proven as really the, the ultimate defense and, and the backbone of a defense of a democracy. But there's a follow-up question from Sajan Sijic, uh, who says, will there be more, at, would there be more appetite if, the countries that want to join uh, have limited voting rights in the council if they were to join. And in this way, we would have two speeds Europe, but with the option of them becoming one in the future. So a, a kind of a, a what, what's it called? A step-by-step -step approach. Gosh, um, I haven't thought about this, but you, then if you have limited voting rights, limited voting rights for what issues? Uh, this is quite complicated. Um, it, it may be that it might be a compromise for for the for diminishing the psychological and political impact of, of the speed of the two speed Europe. Um, um, I have to think about this. <laughs> Sorry. I, 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 it, I mean, it's a halfway house, but maybe 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 halfway houses are needed until they're ready, actually. Actually, maybe this, maybe we, hold, we need a whole different attitude towards the partnership countries and, and the enlargement agenda. It's, it's a good question. Yeah, I think many of us over the years who have been, uh, who are from these countries or have been in this business have advocated a rather proactive uh, approach to, to these issues. You know, take us into the garden. Let, don't have us standing in front yeah. of the wall of the garden. Yeah. And then once we're in the garden, we can advance towards the porch yeah. of the house and then the entry, yeah. et cetera. This you will remember very well, Judy. This was the case with Partnership for Peace. Yeah. Uh, and then finally in 2006, Bush said, well, let's bring in Serbia, Macedonia. Yeah. Uh, and Montenegro. And, and that, that was a really helpful thing. So, you know, uh, uh, maybe a kind of model of partnership for peace before full NATO membership could be applied. And I think that's yeah. what Sajan is implying. And the, case, the, you know, the point that I have made, the, 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 these countries, when we talk about enlargement, were de facto members of the European Union on the migration crisis. They had yeah. to sit at the table in Brussels or Berlin or wherever for the for a common solution to be find, found to these issues. So again, you know, it may sound like a cliche, but no, you know, we, we need to be creative yes. in how do we keep these countries away from malign interests yeah. uh, in, uh, interfering while at the same time being proactive in bringing them in and not, as you said, disrupting the fragile state of where the political integration option is concerned. Great but we, issues we, both of you raise. Yeah, yeah. we, we have the garden. Uh, yeah, we have a question from uh, Zuzia Seleni, again, our fellow from, from uh, the first um, group of, of Europe's Futures Fellows, uh, where she says Hungary was always celebrated as having great institutions in the 1990s but was always criticized on how it implemented them, the point that, that you were, yourself were making, were making. Strong institutions need deeper social trust that we currently lack. So is, is it about, I mean, clearly there are many political dimensions or I, I, would, I would like to say political anthropological dimensions. There's a learning process 
there's the need for society itself to understand that it needs to be the balance. Yeah. And I think that refers to your point about the strength of civil societies. Yeah. We have seen it in Poland, we've seen it in Hungary, we've seen it in Romania with the diaspora coming back, you know, taking flights to protest in, in the streets. Um, and uh, maybe if I can add I to, to, to Zhuzha's comment on this, so the need for, for deeper, deeper social trust, what we're seeing in Poland now with the women and men who are with them trying to defend the, the rights uh, of, you know, uh, being masters of one's own bodies in, in the women's case, which is a massive protest. And it seems to be having some effect because the government did not vote in, in the law and even the president Duda saying that his daughter and wife have, you know, supported the movement. Um, is, is there more a need for citizens to actually be on the street, if I can put it, you know, realistically and metaphorically? Okay. Gosh, I think there's, there's two elements here. And again, um, it's all about, you know, how do we get the rule of law to actually yeah. start living its life? Yeah, um, I, I, I think there's... Um, Communication and social distribution are very important issues. And uh, Shuja mentions that the 1990s, the Hungarians had um, strong institutions. They were strong. It was, Shuja was pretty, it was, remember the Antal government and the, and the HDF, it was pretty, uh, the MDF, it was, it was the beginning, the polarization was there and, and um, I, I, the, 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 um, I think the problem with Hungary is that its its reputation was carried over by the Kadar era in some ways. Oh, this is the Gulag communism, which is a load of nonsense in any case. But in the 1990s, I think the way the privatization was done was extremely destructive and damaging um, because the new elites that emerged uh, were quite corrupt and they were much more interested in defending the new kind of status quo although the new status quo was a bit of the old communist status quo as well. So the institutions, were they strong? Some were, some weren't. The judiciary didn't turn out to be uh, so, so weak. The civil service was, was quite strong. I remember dealing an awful lot with Hungarian civil service in the 1990s before they really got serious about the enlargement. But, um, but there were a lot of people left behind as well. And I, I think one of the weaknesses of the transformation was the, um, we saw this in Poland, yes, they had to do the, the huge economic transformations, but they needed some kind of cushion, social cushion to, to, to keep the institution, to move along the institutions. And I think this is what was lacking in a lot of these countries. On... In that vein, and uh, I, I'd like to ask you a question, and again, it, it all sort of comes back to, you know, do, do we want and uh, can we have uh, strong institutions that are actually functioning and that they're there yeah, sorry. For, yeah. for the citizens and not for the, yeah. Yeah. For, for yeah. the, the wannabes? Um, have, have you read Ivan Krastev and Stephen Holmes's uh, book, the new book, The Light That Failed? Um, you, you know that if, if it's, of course, a simplification of their argument where they say it's about the Eastern Europeans not wanting to imitate the West. Um, I, I have some qualms with, with that too. argument uh, because I think all people want a free society with yes. functioning institutions to, to go back to their normal lives and you know, have a decent uh, salary and go off for a holiday once in a while and to be able to feed, feed their children. Um, and of, of course, th this links into, into this fact. And uh, I'm very glad that you meant mentioned Eastern Germany because it's a kind of a, uh, um, a repair. It's a kind of a, a, a litmus test where, as we all know, billions and billions of Deutschmarks were, would put into it. And yet, yeah. As you said, the political and psychological and, and other dimensions are not there. They, they feel, to simplify, not integrated at all, or rather colonized, if I can put it more dramatically. 
in the fact. So what can we expect in, in these other countries? So maybe if you can reflect a moment on, on that issue. Um, the, the image, uh, I've got slight crowns with Ivan's argument as well about the imitating the West. Um, I mean, imitating is is a kind of it's such a short term. It's a copy. Oh, you're going to copy somebody and then you dump it if you don't like it. Um, and also imitating the West. Um, I don't believe in the idea of the West in this sense. I believe in the idea of universal values. And uh, if the East Europeans are, 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 are no longer want to imitate the West, they have to be very clear. Well, if they use the word imitation, what do they want to go back to and who do they want to imitate, firstly? Um, secondly, um, imitating the West, it hasn't been that bad in terms of, of so far the accountability, the right to travel, the right to get Erasmus programs, um, the modernization of societies. Yes, it's been very complex, but you know, there's an awful lot of West bashing out there, <laughs> which are, are universal values. And um, it would be nice if the EU stood up more for them, firstly. Secondly, Eastern Germany is very interesting. The AfD, the, this far right-wing anti-immigration party is very, very strong there. Um, and it's very strong for a couple of reasons. One is the brains, an awful lot of the brains have left Eastern Germany, especially women. And there's an awful lot of uh, young, um, poorly educated men there, or else they're unemployed, or else they've got poor jobs, and uh, they're easy prey to, to the far right. And, and just one point about the AfD, it's incredibly middle-class, well-off middle-class leadership, but they're pretty, pretty nasty in, in their ideology. Um, particularly anti-Semitic, anti people associate them with anti-migration and anti-Islam, but they're pretty anti-Semitic as well. But the third point is this imitation business, it's, it's a kind of nostalgia. Memories are short. It's a nostalgia for this past, you know, the, the other side is, uh, is, is, is greener. Well, the past was pretty miserable. In, in Central and Eastern Europe and Romania. The persecution was terrible, the imprisonment, the, the, the trial system, the, the lack of recourse, the media, you're sacked if, if, if you were in the tiny opposition in Czechoslovakia, your kids couldn't go to school. There's this nostalgia for a kind of reborn national identity based on the liberal values. Kaczynski said the other day that, um, this is interesting. He said, um, um, the EU is doing more to destroy our values, our liberal Catholic values, than the communists did. I mean, hello You're about nostalgia. A break. <laughs> I mean, let's get the communication straight and let's praise what we are and defend it. And one last point, Europe is not unique. Europe is about... Um, uh, organizing the is uh, the universal values and the people in Belarus or Kyrgyzstan or Azerbaijan or Burma or wherever else they want the same things as we have gotten they want to be part of the human rights system no absolutely I think that that's a that's a very important point um, uh, there, there are no more questions so I'll, I'll we're you know we're about eight minutes away for, from the end, but I, I want to uh, then uh, ask uh, the question about, um, and, and this again goes to the fact, why are people in Poland or in Romania, uh, tolerant is too strong a word, why, why are they not rebelling more against this encroachment on the independence of the judiciary? And it has to do, and I think this is, something that is, is being studied, but, it, it, you know, especially opposition parties, civil society need to drill down deep, more deeply into it, namely uh, the, the Orbans and, and Kaczynskis and, and those in power in Romania are clearly satisfying some social needs, you know, whether it's child benefits, you know, you, you name it. Uh, they're obviously going very haywire in, in other directions but they seem to have found a, a, a niche, a, a thread by which they are able to muster the kinds of majorities that bring them or keep them in power. And I think there must be a clue in there 
on on why the one trumps the other uh, when they go overboard, like the internet law in Hungary or with the CEU, which he managed, of course, to, to kick out, but in Poland now, ov obviously overstepping with, with the abortion law. And, you know, as, as you know better than I, I mean, the, the, the public opinion polls show massive, uh, you know, opposition to having such a drastic law on abortion and yet the 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 high court has ruled it but there's a blowback but on 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 the other levels and your examples of the judges were, were well quoted and i think the international support and solidarity is important but i think there's there's something that's happening there where people have felt that they have gone back to some dimension of the kind of communist social policy, or at least that one segment where, you know, there, there is support for their social needs. This, um, it, it's an unbelievably complex question. Um, this there's, a, there's an element, there's a deep element of social insecurity. Absolutely. It, and, um, and globalization has heightened this. There's no doubt about this. And um, the social insecurity um, sort of sharpens the polarization. And it becomes a, a real competition between the elites of various ideologies. I didn't think ideology would return to Central Europe, but it has. But um, I wonder, I wonder, is it, it's a phenomenon that's taking place in other countries as well, the short termism of political life and the short termism of communication and the way the media is now controlled and the way um, the, the media has been taken over by some or else considered just run by the liberal elites. This has led to the polarization and perhaps driven parts of the societies into their own kind of worldview. We've seen this in the United States. I mean, people vote for Trump, which is against their interests, and they vote for Orban, which is against their interests. And the Hungarians know exactly how corrupt Orban is, but he's also co-opted the whole political structures. So um, it's something worth delving into in this project, Ivan. Okay, there we have a question. I don't know who asked it. What are you talking about? Uh, the judiciary falling under the authority of the executive and the erosion of the rule of law by controlling the judiciary have been taking place in several places in Europe, but also outside of Europe with different political cultures. And, and you've mentioned that. Then why should we tell this as a European story and especially as a transformation story. The equivalence you make between democracy, rule of law and European values in a way excludes all other places which used to have democratic institutions in place like India, Turkey, which have been eroded in a similar way within similar time frame. Don't we need a different frame, one not limited by Europe or a kind of modernization theory? Diasporas, in fact, it is difficult to identify diasporas as democratizing forces just because they are being placed in old Europe. Diasporas usually tend to be conservative force. In contrast to Polish and Romanian diasporas, one could easily think about Hungarian diaspora and their conservative inertia. <laughs> I'm not going to get into an anthropological study of diasporas and their political orientation, but very briefly, um, this is about the EU. And you know we can we can have our problems with India and and Turkey and other countries, but this is about EU members eroding the rule of law and the judiciary, and this is what we have to first defend. And if we cannot defend our own home of democracy and values and the rule of law and accountability, well, we're going down a very rocky path, yeah. and it's going to actually damage us in the end. I, we have to take these members to task. The either Central European or the or the Western European, we're all in this together. There's one more question, which is above the one I just uh, asked or a comment. Um, so I'll, I'll just wait till um, Nicola, who's helping here. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it's from Klaus uh, or, or, or 
I don't know whom. Ivan, let's not forget uh, Orban's two-third majority is based on 48% of the popular vote. If I'm correct, due to constitutional changes made by the socialists before, so the EU must bring forward a real common. Uh, no, so th this is uh, so. Yeah, that's that's one comment that, you know, let's not forget that these are not outright majorities based on the full um, electoral roll call, and that goes for America as well. We know that you yeah. know the American president is elected by about 25 to 30 percent of the electorate so it's it's not a, a majority in real term which a french philosopher castoriadis uh, always pointed out um the the next comment is so the eu must bring forward uh when we talked about the social issue and social support so the eu must bring forward a real common social policy of course in the long distance in, in the long term and um, ivan the EU has to sell itself. And if you're going to have, the EU must, um, must get, get out of the capitals and explain, it, everybody goes, oh, the Eurobarometer, so many, so, many, so many people support the EU. Yeah, that's a comfort zone. But we have to explain why these values matter for, for the EU as a democratic model and his institution, and for non-EU members who see the extraordinary attractiveness of, of Europe. But um, the, the EU leaders, ambassadors, the EAS, all these institutions, um, all, every, we have to do much more in communicating what we really stand for and why it matters. This is about why it matters, that people have the trust in the courts, in the rule of law, and the ability that they can believe in, in these institutions. And if they don't, it's going to be extremely dangerous and a hazardous path for the European Union. We have long, when long speeches by the leaders of the EU won't actually um, change the issue. What will change the issue is a much more hands-on grassroots communication and bringing in, much, uh, bringing in younger people in these countries and, the, and including the diaspora. Okay, Judy, we've come uh, to the end. Thank you so much. I think we've covered a, a lot of ground. Again, like the other project, this one is extremely pertinent to the question of, of Europe's futures that we're trying to tackle here, the rule of law. And I think, uh, uh, you know, once we get to the end of, of this uh, year in June, uh, you'll have very pertinent stories uh, from judges uh, that will show, uh, you know, the, the granularity and the difficulty of this. Uh, what's clear is that as the fall of the Berlin Wall happened, as communist regimes crumbled, the political losers became the economic winners, and they knew that they had to harness the judiciary for their private privatization and economic interests. And unfortunately, uh, even though they voted in, you know, the, the Aki and had, in some cases, you know, pure democratic institutions, as you rightly put it, the implementation was, you know, lacking, <laughs> to put it very gently. And we're still uh, fighting that. And this uh, harnessing of the judiciary or the abuse of the judiciary is in fact being used to various ideological uses, not only to economic uses where, you know, you bribe a judge so that he can put the privatization in your favor, but it's now about a whole ideological conservative Christian view of the world. So we're all looking forward to, to the results. Um, thank you very much. And uh, next week, uh, at the same time, we will have Teresa Reiter, who's our uh, Europe's Futures Fellow here from, from Vienna, Austria, who will be uh, presenting us with a very interesting topic about Europe's uh, intervention or the issue about how it deals with these countries and with Southeastern Europe in particular. So uh, until then, uh, as far as I can see, the American presidential election has not been yet adjudicated. So we'll have to wait maybe until tomorrow or later this evening to find that. So 